we can start. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, welcome back. Um, we're going to talk uh, in this session, we're going to, go to talk about something called support vector machines, right? And mm -hmm. um, you'll see that the, the presentation that I have is more visual than you know the the the, the formulas, the mathematical formulas, and I believe it's more intuitive, uh, you know, to gather the concept of support vectors, uh, you know, graphically than you know just playing by the formula. So, uh, some of the learning objectives that we have is uh, to start explaining certain concepts that are foundational to this uh, algorithm. And the first one is the concept of uh, hyperplanes, all right? So we're going to talk about the optimal hyperplanes that separates uh, each of the, of the classes. Uh, we're going to talk about the binary uh, uh, setting. There are going to be two classes, and we have to find what is called a hyperplane, and I'm going to you know, discuss that next that optimally separates those classes. Then we're going to be uh, you know, expanding about that optimal hyperplane, talking about hard margin classifiers, soft margin classifiers, and then eventually arrive into what is, what, what is really is the support vector machine. Then we're going to uh, you know, follow the textbook and there's an example of the job attrition, the attrition data set that we have been working. Uh, there's a good example on how to apply this algorithm to that, uh, to that data set. Then we're going to go to talk a little bit about feature interpretation and some final thoughts, okay? Okay, so in introduction, and this is kind of a summary of what the, the book, is giving us right here, okay, uh, right here. Um, so super vector machines, it says that it's an approach for mainly for classification. There is also an application for regression, but usually the super vector machines, the 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 forte of this uh, algorithm is really for classification. You know, try to divide. Uh, a space into different different regions or different classes. And it does it based on what is called a hyperplane. So a hyperplane to give it a simple, you know, uh, a simple definition. Let's say that you have a numeric line, right? We have seen the numeric line that goes from the negative to the zero and then to positive uh, numbers. So a hyperplane to divide some, you know, by based on some criteria, those numbers will be in this case because it's a metric line, it's a one-dimensional, you know, uh, figure. The the hyperplane will be a point. In other words, it, it will be a, a you know, a, an n minus one, n minus one, n will be the 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 number of dimensions. The n minus one will be your hyperplane. So for the numeric line, it will be a point. And we know that in geometry, the definition of a point is something that doesn't have any dimensions, right? Then if you see this figure, the figure to the left, all right? So we have a space of two dimensions, right? X1 and X2. So in that space, the hyperplane is going to be then a line. So in a two dimension, the hyperplane is going to be a figure that is one dimensional. So it goes back to, you know, the, the what, let's call it the inferior uh, dimension, not be inferior because of, of, of quality, inferior because it goes, you know, back to the, you know, to, 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 a, to a lesser dimension. Then if we have three dimensions, a space of three dimensions, you know, height, width, depth, then your hyperplane is going to be a two-dimensional uh, figure, 
which is going to be uh, a plane. And that plane is going to divide the regions into, you know, into basically two, two regions, right? And that's what we want to do. So that's the concept, in a nutshell, that's the concept of a fiber plate. It's a figure from a, a, a lesser dimension that uh, separates a feature space into regions or classes, okay? And usually in the in the real world, usually you are going you are not going to have a hyperplane that perfectly uh, separates this into you know the classes that you are you are studying. So one of the things that the support vector machine uses, and we're going to explain this when you know we go through the whole uh, foundational theory, is what is called the kernel trick. Okay. So the support vector machine is going to use a kernel or kind of a transformation of that feature space, okay, to enlarge the feature space to the point that then you can, with an inferior or a lesser uh, uh, dimensional figure, then you can provide uh, a separation of those classes, okay? That's what I tell you that these concepts are is are, are better explained visually than mathematically because mathematically you're not going to see what is going on between the feature space and also the uh the hyperplane all right okay so let's continue and uh following the textbook uh i added also this uh this link, okay, is from StatQuest, and it's a series of uh, of three videos. You know, it's divided in three parts, but the first video explains it very well, and it does, you know, the numeric line with a point, the two-dimensional space, you know, uh, uh, separated by uh, by by a numeric numeric uh, numeric line, on how the support vector machines are 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 constructed, okay. So uh, this is something that you know it's um, it's a must uh, to see it, and it's also, also fun. Uh, the The author of these uh, videos, uh, his name is Josh uh, Stammer. Stammer, uh, he does it pretty pretty well. Okay, all right. So now that we know the concept of hyperplane, we're going to talk about the what is called the hard margin classifier. So in the example. Of the of the textbook, we have a situation on some data on the income of a you know of of a, of a, of, a, of, a, of a subject. We have lot size, so we have you know kind of a let's see you know if 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 if, if we can feel, you know if we can imagine this, we have a person that has you know certain income. Uh, he owns some land, right? You know, certain uh, piece of land, you know, with the acres or the square meters, et cetera. And then we add a criteria, okay? In terms of based on the income and the lot size, if that person really, you know, uh, owns a riding mower. So you can uh, figure or assume, assume that with a higher income, and a bigger lot size, you know, uh, owning a bigger lot size, then it will be more likely that he will own a riding mower instead of the one that you have to push. Okay. And we have this observations, right? You know, you see a group in the left that is grouped by lower income and lower lot size. And it says, right? No, you know, this points actually the, the, the owner doesn't have the owner of the lot, doesn't have a riding mower, and then another group. So how can we divide, you know, these classes by, by, by hyperplane? Well, because it's a two-dimensional, even though we have a criteria that it kind of, you know, uh, is, is, is a dimension by its own, but really we have two dimensions here. So the way that we can separate this, we can use, our uh, logistic regression, right, model. And this is the solid line 
that we have here, uh, we can use what is called a linear, uh, uh, what is called here, uh, discriminant. I think it's called discriminant uh, uh, analysis. Okay, this one, a linear discriminant analysis, which just this is another algorithm, uh, uh, algorithm. Okay, and you have the one that is kind of you know two dashes and 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 and, and a dot right here, and then you have your hard margin classifier which is the one with the dots, okay? So we have infinite possibilities on the, the configuration of the hyperplane for dividing these two classes. Now, in terms of the support vector machines, which is the one that we want to you know, study, we're going to be talking about the, that hard margin classifier. And the hard margin classifier is the one such optimal separated plane and the simplest type of super virtual machines. So how are, are we going to you know, find this? So if we have two clusters, right, two classes, what we're going to do is do like, a, you know, the, the book says a convex hole, right, which is uh, getting a figure that encompasses all the, all the points of one cluster, right? And then we're going to do the same. With the other cluster, you know, the, the outer regions who are going to, you know, link it and have a figure. So there's going to be a, a point or, or, a, or a vertex, right? There's going to be a vertex on, on that, you know, uh, multigon. It's going to be that is going to be the closest to the other point of the cluster, right? So what we're going to do is identify those points, the ones that are closest to each other from you know, those, the, the, the different, different clusters. And then we're going to draw an imaginary line or, or an imaginary segment. Then we're going to trace our hard margin classifier by in the middle point of that segment, but that is perpendicular you know, to, that, to that segment. And that's going to be our hard margin classifier. Then the space that is between that line, that hyperplane, and each of the points of the cluster is going to be the margin. So you have you know, the, 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 the hyperplane, and also you have, excuse me, you have also the margin. So that's going to be your hard margin classifier. And as you can see, all the points of each of the clusters are going to be in one or the other side of that HMC. All right. So far with me here. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. So let's, uh, you know, throw 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 a wrinkle here. Uh, you know, uh, get get a little bit more uh, more complicated. Sometimes this perfect separation is achievable, but not desirable. And what happens when one of the points, let's say that this is our, right? This one is our hard margin classifier, but there's a point that belongs to this class, to the no uh, writing board class, but is on the other side that is supposed, supposed to be on the yes side, right? You know, that's, it, it, yeah, it could be an outlier or it could be, you know, so something else that is happening there. So what happens? Uh, our hard margin classifier then is is going to give us, uh, you know, like a false, uh, a false. Uh, uh, in this case, a false negative, right? Uh, because truly that point is going to be uh, a no point, but then uh, is going to be predicted as a yes. Okay, I say yes, uh, right. So it's going to be a, I believe it's a false, uh, a false negative, I believe, you know, in the in the confusion matrix. So one of the things that you could do is try to adjust, right, your classifier. Try to adjust it so that that point belongs to this cluster. But what happens in in the in the you know, what you're doing is that you are trying to adjust that hyperplane based on just one point, okay? And maybe that one point could be a outlier, could be some noise. 
So in other words, what you're trying to do is trying to get all that information from that you know, group of cluster and try to accommodate your algorithm. Uh, what happens when you do that in the real world? We have seen this in the other algorithms when we try to incorporate a lot of information into our, you know, our model. And then what happens when we get new data? That's overfitting. That would be overfitting. Exactly. This is a classic example of overfitting. Okay. You know, you're trying to accommodate all the information that you have when, you know, when, you, when the new data, data comes, then it doesn't generalize. So this is a, an example of, you know, what overfitting, you know, could, could look like. All right. So what is the, yes, uh, support vector machine, because it's a distance-based algorithm. Yes, it's sensitive uh, to all lives. That's true. So the way that we're going to then, you know, deal with this is with what is called a soft margin classifier. Instead of the hard uh, margin classifier, we're going to add a parameter that is going to give you some leeway, some leeway to accommodate most of the points in each of the classes, but some of them are going to be left as you know false negatives or false positives, depending on how you're dealing with the problem. So in the soft margin, you have what is called a, a C, a cost, a cost parameter, okay? So when C is zero, the soft margin becomes the hard margin classifier. In other words, you know, it's just between those two points that are closer to each other. And then, you know, you do your math, you know, to get your hard margin classifier and your margins. If you do C as infinite, then it's, it's going to the opposite way. It's going to get all the points <laughs> in, in, the, in the margin, all right? All the points in the margin. And, you know, it's, it's going to be really uh, a, a, a really poor uh, a model because it's going to encompass almost everything, <laughs> okay? So there has to be a way that we can tune this parameter to get the optimal, okay? Based on a metric, right? On a loss function, based on a metric on how, you know, to trace that margin. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a buffer. Uh, mar it's, it's it's really the margins. Okay, in other words, it, instead of the hard margins that you have between those closer points, you are going to expand that margin to try to accommodate as much as possible without, with with, with uh, you know avoiding the overfitting problem. Okay, good. All right. Good. So, so now now we are closer to you know, the, 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 the support vector machine, because now we have, we know the concept of the hard margin classifier. We have the soft margin, which introduces the C parameter, you know, the, the, the allowable margin of budget, buffer zone, like uh, Keno says. And then the, the, the final piece of the support vector machine is what is called the kernel trick, okay? So in this, and you know you can delve with you know the mathematics of it, but I believe that visually uh, you are going to you know going to get the idea. So let's say that remember that in the in the previous problem we had really two uh, distinguishable classes, right? The ones with the writing mower and the one without. It. What happens in this space? Okay, so we have the orange, right, that goes around, you know, the perimeter, and then some uh, green uh, points that are a little bit more uh, centered. Okay, so this is our feature space. So what the kernel trick does is that it transforms your space. In other words, it's enlar it enlarges your space, and it adds. In this case, it adds another dimension. Okay, instead of a two-dimensional, we're going to convert it to a three-dimensional. And now we have this kind of figure, okay? This kind of figure. And as you can see, when we introduce this, most of the orange points are kind of, you know, going, uh, you know, increasing into the X3 dimension and the greens stay at the bottom. So now we can theoretically, you know, uh, construct a hyperplane, which is a plane, in this case, a two-dimensional uh, figure, 
that can then cut this region between the greens and the oranges, okay? Imagine that I'm drawing like a plane there, okay, to divide the greens and the oranges. The hyperplane then, it goes back to the original or the original space that we had, and we're going to get this figure, okay? Which is the projection of that plane intersecting the spaces between orange and green, okay? And it's going to be kind of a circle here, all right? So that's basically, in a nutshell, that is the kernel trick. It's a transformation of the original feature space, trying to get that hyperplane, okay, for uh, formulated in that enlarged feature space and then go back and project it into the original space, all right? So what are the most popular functions in the, in, uh, the kernel uh, functions for the, for the support virtual machines? Well, the first one is the radial basis. In fact, that's usually the, 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 the default of that. Then we have the polynomial uh, basis, which is transformation based on, you know, on, on polynomials, on you know, powers. And then we have the hyperbolic uh, tangent. I believe there's another one. I've seen it in, uh, at least in tidy models, uh, which is called uh, lib linear. Also, we can we can add uh, that one there. So there are different kind of kernels that you can then uh, test to your data set and to see which is the one that is giving you the best, you know, the best results. Okay, and that is the support vector machine. You know, the composition of the soft margin with the combination of the kernel uh, function, all right? Okay, so let's uh, do an example. Before that, we have been talking about binary, right? Classification, but there's some, there are some uh, you know, problems that uh, deal with more than two classes, multi-class. Uh, multi so there can be two approaches to use this, uh, you know, support vector machines. And also this could be applied also to the logistic regression, you know, by the way, which is uh, the OVA method one versus uh, all, which fits uh, support vector machines for each class and classify to the class for which the margin is the target. Then we have one versus one, which fit all pairwise support vector machines and classify the class that wins the most pairwise competitions, okay? So this one is kind of, you know, fitting as a support vector machines for each class and then try to figure out, you know, what is the composition of that hyperplane. In the oval, which requires a little more computation, you are going to fit each of the classes and you are going to choose the one, the pairwise combination that, you know, gives you the 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 better the better metric the better uh, you know the the, the mini, minimizing that that loss function that we're going to use okay all right so let's go okay one more thing uh, one more thing uh, I said at the beginning that the support vector machines usually is uh, is uh, applied to classifications. Uh, uh, problems, but also you can apply it also to uh, continuous, okay, Re uh, a regression and support vector regression. And what you're going to do here is usually the same thing. The other the, the 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 difference is that instead of dividing the classes, because you have a continuous variable, what you're going to do is try to get those margins that have the most points on that on that regression. And of course, there's going to be points outside those margins. Those are going to be your errors, okay? And you're going to have to optimize those margins to try to get the best model that generalizes in that regression continuous line without uh, producing too many, you know, too many points that are outside the margin. It's kind of a reverse. Uh, the support vector regression, the 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 mechanism is kind of reverse of the classification, okay? The classification, you are separating. Here, you're trying to group between, between those two margins that we talk about in the soft margin 
uh, classifier. And there's also a link that, you know, try to explain also visually, you know, how the support vector regression uh, works. Okay. Hmm. Okay, now we go to the, to the example. So the example that we have here is our, uh, uh, we, we know the example is the job uh, attrition uh, uh, data set, okay? Uh, we do the same, the same thing. Uh, we uh, split our data set, okay, into the training and the testing. And then using the carrot uh, framework, we're going to tune because we need to tune to apply the, the support vector machine. We need to tune the C parameter, okay? You know, the, 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 the C uh, uh, figure. And we're going to use the radial basis uh, kernel, that's the default uh, kernel in a tenfold uh, cross validation. Okay, so this is the instruction, right? Uh, you have the SMV radial, we're using the current lab uh, package here, okay? It doesn't show there, but you're always in the car lab package. Uh, one important thing is that, uh, you know, um, similar to uh, linear regression, also uh, KNN also, uh, you have to uh, normalize your numeric, uh, numerical data. So in the pre-process here, in the carry, you have a pre-process uh, function. You're going to center and scale. So that gives you the normalization that you need for the the, scale, the the ranges of each of the numerical features. Why? Because ranges that are you know larger than others can influence you know negatively your model. And we're going to do a ten you know ten passes. The tune length is going to be a ten ten different values for C. Okay. So when you uh, run this, you're going to get this churn SMV uh, object. If we apply the ggplot, kind of a similar to the autoplot that we apply in tally models, the ggplot, then you get a graph on the measures of the cost that we use that in that tune length, okay? That's, you know, randomly uh, assigned. And then you see that in this case, uh, the model kind of stabilizes at this point, okay? And apparently this point is around 30, you know, 30, which is the, the which will be the magnitude of the, of C, okay? You can see it uh, in a table here, okay? In a table here, you can see it for, you know, different values of C, and then the, the measure that we're are using, which is accuracy or the cross validation, which is the average of each of the tenfolds. So as you can see, the one that really, you know, uh, gets to the maximum and then just stays is that number, 32, all right? So in 32, the C plateaus, which is the highest accuracy and also the highest uh, kappa uh, measure, all right? But as we know, you know, from previous, uh, examples that we have seen in different algorithms, uh, accuracy is not your best uh, loss function, okay? Why? Because accuracy is only giving you half of the confusion matrix, okay? It's giving you the true positives, the true negatives, you add it up and then divide it by the total observations. But what happens to the false positives and the false negatives, okay? This is especially uh, critical when you have imbalanced uh, data sets, where you can have a great accuracy measure, but then you are missing in catching some of the minority, uh, uh, you know, uh, classes. Okay, so in this case, okay, uh, we are going to do. Okay, uh, what, one of the things that also the books mentions before going into the into the next step on the job attrition is that uh, most classification algorithms treat misclassification costs equally. In other words, what they're trying to balance is the number of false negatives and false positives. No matter 
uh, the cost associated with them. And the support vector machines, and also, you know, most of the three uh, base models allow you to assign specific misclassification costs to different outcomes. And that is, and that is very uh, convenient because let's say in an attrition model, if you predict that a person is not going to, you know, leave uh, your organization, right? It's not going to churn. But then, you know, uh, the, the true uh, outcome of that person is that, you know, it left the organization, then you have a cost associated with that mis, uh, mis, mis uh, prediction. okay? Different when you predict that that person is going to leave your organization, you're going to change, but then it doesn't, okay? So the person is still there in the organization. So the costs usually are going to be less than when the person leaves the organization because it's, it's creating disruption in your, you know, in, 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 in your, uh, uh, in, in your work workflow system, okay? So that's something that uh, you should be aware that there could be different costs for different misclassifications on your model, okay? So in this, you know, second, you know, second pass, what we're going to do is that instead of using accuracy as the, as the loss function, you know, for try to determine which is the best uh, number for C, we're going to use something called the AUC, okay? Which is the area under the curve and it's associated with the ROC curve, the receiver's operating char characteristics, okay? Which gives you all the possibilities of the sens sensitivity and specificity of each of the instances when, you know, uh, you know the the uh, the the the, thre the threshold you know is is being is is being tested, okay. So here, remember that when we started, okay, we didn't uh, we didn't mention anything about loss function here, right? Okay, uh, the default is accuracy. So here now the metric is going to be ROC. And the ROC activates that ROC curve. And what it's going to do is trying to maximize that area under the curve, all right? So that area, you know, as, as close as you can get to one, uh, you get, if you, if you achieve one, you get the perfect classifier. If you achieve a little bit less than one or more than 0.5, then you are doing better than random, right? So we're going to run it with the metric ROC instead of, uh, instead of accuracy. And now we get a different uh, picture here, okay? When we get that object, churn uh, super vector machines, uh, AUC results, we see that the ROC, we're maximizing the ROC, the maximum more, more number of the ROC on the end of the curve is 0.827, all right? you know, with the decimals. And it's associated with a C, right? With a C of two, instead of the 32 that we had uh, before, okay? And we can verify this with the confusion matrix, okay? We didn't do the confusion matrix. We should have done a confusion matrix to, you know, uh, uh, compare apples to apples. But here with the confusion matrix, we see clearly that with a C of two, we are trying to, you know, maximize all this, you know, uh, all these numbers on the on the true positive, true negatives, false positives, false negatives. Okay, and one of the things that we can, you know, see right away is that this one, which is when you put a no, and the actual outcome is yes, right? Okay, uh, it's a little bit high. Okay, it's about ten percent of the total of this you know, of, of, of these observations, okay? So what you can do is try to uh, play with that threshold instead of being, you know, the same for each of the of these outcomes, try to play with that threshold to see if we can minimize this because this costs more than this one, okay? This is the example that I told you when 
we predict that the person is not going to leave, but then actually it leaves the organization. The cost associated with that is much higher than this one. When the person is predicted to, to go, but then it stays in the company. All right. Okay. Any questions so far? We're good? Yeah, we could. We're good, yeah. we're good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing that I want to mention is that the, the our friend H2O, okay? Uh, he has, uh, I don't remember if he has support vector machines, but in the algorithms that the H2O has, usually when we're dealing with a classification problem, he try to test different thresholds. In other words, different, uh, you know, cut points between the, you know, the, the, the yes classification or the no classification in the binary classification. And then it tries to maximize also that threshold, all right? But again, uh, H2O does it to try to, you know, balance these numbers, the false positive and the false negatives. You have to add that cost, you know, element, all right? That cost element to then get the threshold that is going to be minimizing that cost associated with the false negatives and the false positive. Okay. All right. So, what about feature interpretation? Well, support vector machines do not have internally do not have a mechanism for feature interpretation. However, uh, this package called VIP variable importance uh, package. Uh, can help us to quantify the importance of each feature in the support vector machines using a permutation approach. And I got this uh, code from you know one of the stack overflows that you know was mentioned that SVM, how can you calculate feature uh, importance or variable importance with support vector machines? So this was the their answer. So you get this function, right? That you're going to apply within the VIP. Uh, you know, uh, a function of the VIP package, you're going to have this function that what it does is that it calculates the predictions for the class that you are interested in. This, in this case, the class is yes. Okay, if it's going to churn or not. Then you're going to, you know, uh, put these parameters in place. You're going to do kind of a simulation here. Okay, uh, a simulation of five for the permutation. Uh, the target is going to be attrition, which is one of the, 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 the response variable in this case. The metric is going to be uh, the same one as the ROC, AUC. The reference class is yes, and then the prediction wrapper is going to be this function, okay? So when you run this, then you get this plot, which is similar to the plots that we have seen before, but this one you know, requires a little bit more, you know, uh, uh, more, uh, uh, you know, uh, development. So here, what we see is that globally, the model is using the first feature that is using to separate the classes is overtime. Okay, so uh, persons that have, you know, more overtime than others are going to be more likely to churn than the ones that are not in overtime. The same thing about job roles. There's some job roles that are more, uh, pro, uh, you know, uh, prone to uh, churn than others, and business travel also. Okay. So to complete the picture, uh, we have some partial dependence plots, which is the prediction for each of the, you know, some of the variables that we have uh, interpreted as important. So, for example, in overtime. You see that there's a big difference between the ones that have, you know, have, have been in overtime and the ones that have not. And you see the probability that really jumps here compared to the other class. Then in the job role, you see that some job roles are more, uh, the probability is higher than others in terms of churning. And you see, for example, human resources, you see labor, laboratory technician, you see sales representatives, et cetera. So these jobs are you know, more probable to churn than others. And we can keep going using that analysis, all right? 
So, final thoughts. What are the advantages of the support uh, vector machine? Well, support vector machines, as you can see, is very flexible. Okay, depending on the kernel that you're using, you can separate, draw different types of hyperplanes, not necessarily linear, uh, different hyperplanes that can then, you know, do a good separation between your classes. Uh, support vector machines using the kernel, using the kernel are relatively robust. Uh, 12 layers compared to the hard, you know, margin classifier that we that we you know that we study, which is not that robust. But when you incorporate the C parameter, you incorporate the the kernel trick, then you know you have some robustness there. And uh, like I said, depending on the kernel function, they're very flexible and adaptive. So what are the disadvantages of it? One of the disadvantages, and that's why you don't see that much support vector machines in you know, the machine uh, learning uh, a world, is that it's not scalable, okay? Uh, you know, as, as you get more to big data, let's say, uh, you know, uh, 100 million, <laughs> 100 million observations, uh, the support vector machine is going to be too, uh, you know, uh, too cumbersome uh, to, you know, to run. Okay, because of the math involved in the kernels and trying to get that, that hyperplane separations. Also, the super vector machines produce class labels, not class probabilities. And that is something that even though there could, there could be some adjustments, like the one that I did with the feature importance, there could be some adjustments you know, to get some class probabilities. Uh, the model really is not you know, uh, originally uh, engineered for that. And usually you, you, you have uh, an advantage when you get the class probabilities because then you can adjust your threshold, your cut, cut off point. And also requires special procedures to handle multimonomial classification problems. And the ones that I uh, told you are the ones that are used, the OVA, uh, one versus all, or one versus one, okay? So that's basically it <laughs> for the support vector machines. <laughs> okay, so that's great. So you actually kind of uh, kind of explain very very thoroughly what the support vector 